Okay, I think I'm going to make a start on this meeting. Um, we've still got a few people um, coming into the room, but um, we've got a lot to get through this evening. So I'm going to push ahead and make a start. Um, so first of all, I just want to say um, good evening and I really want to say a really warm welcome to this webinar. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your evening to join us. Uh, my name is Heidi Chow and I am the Executive Director of Jubilee Debt Campaign. And we also have Zach um, this evening, who's going to be our host on the chat. Um, and we are hosting this event um, with our lovely friends from Global Justice Now. So um, this weekend is the start of COP26, um, the International Climate Summit, which is being hosted by the UK in Glasgow. And as the world's attention turns to the climate emergency, we want to use this as an opportunity to draw the links between climate and debt, because there can be no climate justice without debt justice. And we have a great panel of inspiring speakers this evening who I'm personally really excited um, about listening to, um, and they're going to be unpacking this subject for us in much more depth. Um, but first of all, I'm just going to cover uh, some housekeeping items. Um, so first of all, if you are turning up to the room now, please feel free to um, use the chat function and say where you are in from across the UK or across the world. Um, I was just saying earlier, it's nice for us as speakers to know uh, where people are tuning in from. Um, and also please feel free to use the Q&A function to ask questions to any of our speakers. There's an icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen and we have left some time at the end for the speakers to answer your questions. Um, I also want to apologise um, that uh, one of the speakers that has featured on our earlier promotion, um, Mitzi Janelle Tan, who's a youth climate activist from Fridays for Future um, from the Philippines, she had to drop out. And so unfortunately, she won't be joining us this evening. So I'm really sorry if you've tuned in just to listen to her. Um, but I hope that you won't be disappointed because we do have a stellar lineup um, of speakers still. Um, we also have Belle Ribeiro Addy, who's going to be joining us around uh, 10 past seven, um, but she will need to leave promptly after her contribution because she is launching a new parliamentary group um, this evening, straight away after her contribution here. Um, but before I hand over to the speakers, I just want to start by giving a brief introduction on the connection between debt and climate. Um, at the start of the pandemic, many countries in the global south were already in debt crisis, battling a mountain of unsustainable debts created by a global economy that extracts power, resources and wealth into the hands of wealthy governments and corporations. Last year alone, over $370 billion left lower income countries in debt repayments. And these are vital resources that could have been directed to tackling the climate emergency and the pandemic. And instead, our research, which was published today, shows that lower income countries are now paying five times more in debt than they are spending on fighting the climate crisis. Meanwhile, rich polluting countries are failing to deliver the hundred billion dollars a year of climate finance that they promised over a decade ago. And this amount is nowhere near enough. Um, but what rich countries have provided, over two thirds of that is in the form of loans and not grants which is making Global South countries rack up even more debt on top of existing debts. Now, without adequate climate finance, countries will have no choice but to borrow, especially after a climate disaster, like a hurricane or a flood, in order to pay for the reconstruction and rebuilding. And ultimately, this is an issue about climate justice. The climate crisis was created by rich polluting countries through centuries of industrialization, colonialism and extraction. And so when we talk about debt, actually the real debt that needs settling is the climate debt that rich countries owe to the global south. And it's a principle recognized by the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, that those that have historically contributed the most to climate change are the most, um, that are most responsible for dealing with its impacts. And yet rich polluting countries are hiding from their responsibilities and they are not delivering the already inadequate amount that they promised. And what they are providing, most of it is in the form of loans. So I was thinking about this and I was just thinking how it's like, it's like a rich person comes along and sets fire to your house um, and they're making money from the arson. And then instead of giving you compensation, they offer you a loan to rebuild your home. So you are left with nothing and you become even more indebted to the rich person who burnt down your house in the first place. And for me, this is also a matter of racial injustice. 
colonialism that enriched the global north was based on the idea that black and brown lives were worth less. And so when rich countries refused to take action um, that is needed to address the climate and debt crises, um, this for me is like a racist response that demonstrates the, the complete disregard for the lives of people in the global south, lives that um, can be discarded or sacrificed just to protect the economic interests of the wealthy, the elite and corporations. And so that's why we need an anti-racist response, that there is no climate justice without debt justice. And we need to break this cycle of debt where the climate emergency is driving countries into more debt and then more debt then goes on to make it impossible to fight the climate emergency. And we break this cycle by demanding to cancel the debt. Now our speakers this evening are going to fill out different aspects of this big picture for us. Um, and we're really looking forward to hearing from them um, and, we, and they'll hopefully inspire us to, to take action on this issue. Um, and so it gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome our first speaker, Dr. Faiza Shaheen. Uh, Faiza is a program head of inequality at the New York University Center on International Cooperation. She's also an economist, activist, and author. And Pfizer recently launched new research that exposed how severe the debt crisis is right now. Her analysis shows that around 100 countries are facing cuts to public spending because of high levels of unsustainable debt. Pfizer, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'm really looking forward to hearing more about your research and I'll hand the floor over to you now. Thank you, Heidi, and it's really great to be here and, and to speak amongst you on this really important issue. I think every time I, um, people will know me from doing more UK based work, but periodically I come back to doing international work and, you know, the debt issue in particular really makes me so angry for all of the reasons that you've said, Heidi. I mean, so you look at the list of the countries and it's no surprise that, you know, the majority of these are, are ex-colonial countries um, and countries that um, have been put in debt um, by, by rich countries, essentially. Um, and now we see this problem and ballooning. Um, and this is for someone that remembers, that's old enough to remember the, the first time you had this debt campaign and uh, the debt cancellation and the jubilation around that, that cancellation. Um, you know, really we hadn't solved the problem and here we are um, very, with the problem actually getting a lot more complicated and I'll, I'll talk about that in a, in a moment. I want to start by coming at it from a slightly different direction rather than the climate crisis to think more about um, COVID recovery. As part of my work at NYU, we um, speak to about 10, 10 plus countries um, that work with us on various different policies to address inequality. Um, and they are a mix of low, middle and high income countries. Um, and back in April, we were having a meeting um, with representative ministers um, from these different countries. Um, and there was just a clear difference between what we were hearing from the low and middle income countries and what they saw were their biggest problems in terms of COVID recovery versus the rich countries. Um, and one of the things that really struck me just thinking about the, the ripple effects of this debt was that we had the governor of the Bank of Tunisia, who's one of our partners, speak and he was really quite agitated and, and, and desperate talking about the debt situation that Tunisia was in and telling us that, look, if we don't get help on this, we're gonna have a huge, we're gonna be in huge political hot water. We can already see that coming through. Um, and that was in April and within a matter of months, there was huge political instability issues with the government there um, and huge pushback um, amongst the public. And, you know, he, he told us that that was gonna happen. He was going around to the IMF, um, you know, essentially begging for money saying, look, if you, you're gonna throw us off course, it's one thing to give us a Nobel uh, Peace Prize uh, after, after the revolution, but you've got to actually support us in terms of debt cancellation. And that didn't happen, that hasn't been forthcoming. And the country is, is in real, real trouble um, now. And I just want us to think about uh, this debt issue in terms of climate, yes, but also in the priorities that countries are facing. And um, one of the other things that we hear from the countries that we're working with is that um, not only are they worried about how much they spend on climate, but they don't have the money, for instance, um, for vaccines. They don't expect uh, COVAX, COVAX hasn't been strong enough to give them the vaccines they need. And some of them are looking to buy these vaccines, but actually having to borrow 
to buy these vaccines. And this is why the issue is, you know, it's it was already a huge injustice and it, it's just getting worse by the day and the repercussions are, are huge um, internally for, for a number of these countries. We already know that um, at least 64 countries spend more on external debt service than they do on healthcare. Um, and, and that's really, I mean, a very difficult thing for them to, to talk about and, and for them to um, sustain going forward because of course the populations in their countries are saying, well, why aren't we spending more on healthcare? Um, and it's causing huge political upheaval. So we actually weren't planning when we were doing our work on policies that work on inequality and exclusion to do um, work on debt. But because of what we were hearing from these low and middle income countries, we decided to look into it in a bit more depth. Um, and we found, um, despite some of the ways in which IMF and the World Bank talk about it, where they talk about 35 to 40 countries in serious debt distress, we found that the numbers are actually much higher when you look across a number of different indicators. We found that there's 100 plus countries, around 103 countries, so 54, 53% uh, of um, UN member states, so more than more than half of countries, are at risk of having to cut public spending as their debt has become unsustainable. And what does that mean then? So that means, um, you know, immediate priorities around health, around education, um, day to day spending. And then you can imagine that addressing issues like climate are falling further down that list. And so, you know, we have to think about where countries are prioritizing their money um, and understand that um, when the debt crisis hits, it's all of these other, other, other issues that people are asking for, public services um, and social protection measures and um, become more of a, of a priority for the money that's left. Um, and so my concern is, is that countries are already squeezed on the basic necessities just to get through the days, let alone thinking about um, where they can spend more on the climate crisis. They can't even spend what, what they have been doing and um, what they have already in existence. So what, what are they going to do uh, in terms of spending more? And it's really important to think about that financing gap, that financing gap across these different issues. Um, and so there's a number of papers that find that the gap is huge um, already in terms of um, so five, 528 billion for low and middle income countries and um, just on five sustainable development goal priority areas, education, health, roads, electricity, water and sanitation. Um, and so that gap is only getting bigger as time um, goes on. So what does this mean? What do we have to do going forward? And, and this is a crisis. We shouldn't, we shouldn't, um, we should be talking far more about it. Actually, I'm quite shocked, even at the international level, how, how little attention this, the debt crisis is getting. Um, of course, we shouldn't be doing what Rishi Sunak is doing, which is to cut aid, which is to um, use these special drawing rights, which is essentially an injection of, of money globally um, to, to um, spend less in terms of, of aid. We have to uh, commit to the Climate Justice Fund. We have to give that 100 billion a year, the climate finance that's needed. And you know, rich countries have to fulfill those obligations. Um, but it, to unlock the debt issue, we also have to think about the immediate expansion of vaccine supply and, finance, uh, supply and financing for those vaccines. It's just such a roadblock for countries. They just can't move forward without that. Um, we have to um, redistribute those special drawing rights and to reallocate. So rather than all this money that rich countries have got, this extra money that they've got, thinking that they can use that to um, start to uh, lower aid, they should actually be more generous with giving that money back to low and middle income countries. Um, and of course, we need to think about debt relief in the 100 plus countries um, that are fiscally constrained. Um, but like all of this, uh, and this can be very quickly become a techie argument, all of this really does mean that we have to build the movement. We've got to have more people angry about this issue. We've got to have more people placing pressure on governments to do something. Um, and from where I sit, just coming out of the UN General Assembly and the events that I saw here and was involved in, is that whilst low and middle income countries are continually, continually bringing this issue up, um, it's, it's actually quite rare to get much of a response um, from the multilateral institutions, uh, international financial institutions and rich countries on what they're specifically gonna do uh, to help on this. So absolutely pleased to be here today and appreciate all the work that 
uh, Heidi, you and your team do, um, and keen to think about how we place pressure and, and really build the movement like we did in the early noughties. Thank you, Pfizer, for your contribution. And it's really um, it's so interesting hearing your feedback from the meetings that you had with a range of different um, countries. Um, yeah, like you said, low middle income countries and hearing the feedback that um, uh, that debt was a real issue for a lot of those countries. Um, and also when you look at, like you said, a whole wider range of indicators, actually finding out that half the world's countries are actually experiencing a debt crisis, I think really underscores how serious a problem this is. And I just want to say, say that we do share your anger, Pfizer, like we completely share your anger about this issue. You're right, like it's, this is um, not something that we should stay quiet about. And so that's why I'm so glad that you're able to join us this evening um, so that we can kind of really unpick some of these issues and see how um, you know the high levels of unsustainable debt are, are a complete roadblock block sorry to achieving not just climate justice but to achieving um, uh, people's uh, rights to health people's rights to education people's rights to public services um, so yeah so thank you so much for that um, I'm going to introduce our next speaker now. Um, we have uh, Chris Sinclair, who is an international trade and development specialist and a policy advisor with the Caribbean Policy Development Center uh, based in Barbados. Um, there at the, um, where he works on both debt and climate issues. Um, and Chris uh, um, has held a number of positions in the government of Barbados. Um, he is the former uh, Minister of Finance and the former Minister of Foreign Affairs. So it's a real privilege Privilege having you speak um, at our event um, this evening, Chris. Um, the Caribbean is on the front lines of both the climate and the debt crisis. Uh, Caribbean islands and other small island developing states are responsible for just 0.2% um, of global emissions. And yet uh, countries in the Caribbean and other small island developing states are being repeatedly devastated by climate disasters, such as um, um, hurricanes um, and storms and so on. So anyway, I'm gonna hand over to Chris. Um, it'd be really great to hear um, from your experiences um, in the Caribbean. And, and yeah, thank you so much for joining us today, Chris. Uh, I'll hand it over to you now. Thank you very much, Heidi, and a uh, pleasant good evening to all the colleagues. Um, it is really for us, and certainly for me, representing the Caribbean Policy Development Center on this occasion, uh, a privilege to be here because I think that this, uh, this discourse has, has been the case with all of the others that uh, you've done at Jubilee and, and, and other partners who have brought a very sharp and clinical focus on the issue of debt and climate and the interconnectedness of the two um, issues and as well as the previous speaker has said, so many others uh, which impinge and impact on, uh, on economies of developing countries, um, those uh, middle income developing countries and uh, poor countries, and of course, those in the middle um, so considered small and vulnerable economies. And so it is, um, it is really quite um, uh, interesting to hear and to see how the world is responding to these uh, particular challenges. I think that Heidi, you probably hit the nail on the head um, quite distinctly when you spoke about the injustice of what is happening. Uh, and for the Caribbean, it is almost as though it is a premiere movie. I mean, we, you know, we are actually living this thing, living the, effect, the effects of the climate crisis living the mal effects of the debt crisis, but having ourselves not really contributed, uh, certainly not uh, in any significant extent to the uh, climate crisis, but having, of course, to finance and pay for it. Um, and that is the real injustice. You spoke about, you made a very interesting analogy about a, a rich country or a rich person catching your house of fire and then offering you money to uh, repair it. Uh, and I really do like that analogy. Uh, but what is even more egregious is if, if that rich person, as in the case of developing countries, uh, catches your house of fire and they want to take credit for the fact that they call the fire service uh, first to come put the blaze out. That is really what is happening in, 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 in essence with what is happening with the climate crisis and the debt. Um, the major contributors of it, we know who they are. They set targets, 
the GOTO meetings, like the COP and the other uh, UN meetings and the other multilateral meetings. We establish the targets. They say we're going to meet the targets. And then they boast about the fact that um, they are putting money, um, and some of it very shallow money, to help solve the problem. When in truth and fact, a lot of those resources are either not accessible because of the complicated nature in which they are, the de design uh, mechanisms for accessing are so complicated, or secondly, because so much of it, as you said, two thirds, uh, come in the form of loans. And those countries who are undercapacitated, underdeveloped, um, who have very small um, economies, are incapable of borrowing that level of money. And if they do borrow it, are equally incapable of repaying it. Because that is then layered on top of other debts which uh, come about because of systemic and structural weaknesses in those economies. And we know what those structural weaknesses are, the remoteness, the smallest of size, the vulnerability to uh, natural disasters, all of these things the underdeveloped capital markets, these things contribute systemically to hemming those economies into a particular form of activity uh, or activities that are not themselves uh, uh, large enough or concentrated enough to be able to produce the kind of wealth to allow those countries to be able to repay the debt that they have to incur. And so when you layer the climate part of it on top of all of these things, uh, many of which come out of the colonial experience, and many of which have not been addressed in a serious way or systematic way, um, then you have basically a double whammy of challenges facing uh, many of these countries. So when we say, for example, and I, I've had to have personal experience with this as being a minister of finance myself. When you say that countries spend more money on debt than they spend on healthcare or education, this is not just a statement of fact. It is a statement of the reality of the structural deficiencies of these economies. In, in, in other words, the way in which they have been established from colonial times dictate <laughs> that they carry a legacy of debt. In other words, you inherit a legacy of debt from colonialism and you're always paying that debt. So regardless of how much you do, how much ambition you have for health and education and infrastructure and social welfare and women's development and youth development, there will always be systemically and systematically a underdevelopment of those sectors, naturally because you are borrowing to develop. Them. And when you have to borrow that money, much of which for small vulnerable economies in the Caribbean is borrowed on the international capital markets at risk premium. And the risk premium is because the economies are small, they're underdeveloped, and therefore they have a greater risk of default. So there's always a risk premium on private capital. When you borrow at a risk premium, what happens is that the cost of that uh, grows exponentially. So therefore you are always locked into what we, you know, in the 70s and 80s used to call a debt trap. We are basically in a debt trap because you're borrowing to develop. You're born to develop education, you're born to develop uh, 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 healthcare, you're born to develop your technology, you're born to develop your infrastructure, and you're born it at a cost. Now that cost is either the risk premium in the private capital markets, or that cost is from the multilateral institutions like the IMF through austerity programs, which themselves on the developed countries, uh, so to speak, because of the level of fiscal consolidation required to be able to meet the targets which have been established by the IMF and the World Bank and so forth through structural adjustment programs and standby arrangements and all of these things. So when we speak about uh, debt and climate and uh, underdevelopment and underspending on development, this is really a systemic issue. And it can only be developed by disaggregating the root causes of the problem and then addressing those before you re-compact uh, them into um, some nice 
shape or form that allows for true and genuine development of sectors, of people, of businesses, and of countries generally. I am afraid that the ambitions which have been established for the climate situation are too timid, too uh, uh, limited, and too lacking in innovation to address the issue. So as we go towards COP, um, for example, uh, yesterday or day before, the Canadians and the German uh, ministries of finance on the, on the uh, uh, invitation from the British uh, government um, put out a program on financing Canada. And the program basically is a regurgitation of what was said before. In other words, they're not promising any new monies they are promising to try to achieve the targets which they already said they wanted to achieve, but they pushed it back a little further from 2020 to achieving $100 billion a year to 2024-25. They're not adding new money to this. This is all money that is being, you know, recycled with a, as they say, a greater level of commitment because they now understand that the challenge is far more systemic than they originally thought, and therefore they need to uh, pay some urgent attention to it. Well, the urgency has uh, you know, the, the urgency has now gone. We are now on the on the precipice, based on the UN High Level um, Committee report, that the target of 1.5 degrees is not going to be reached, and in fact, will likely not be achieved if we do not take immediate actions now. And therefore the threat of sea level rise, the threat of even greater crisis um, in terms of impacts from the climate, uh, climate events is facing small vulnerable economies such as those in the Caribbean, like Barbados that I come from, where we can see the sea reclaiming uh, large portions of land. And then you have to spend tremendous amount of money to defend your shoreline uh, from the ravages of sea level rise and encroachment. We are seeing it in real time. And the issue now that has been put on the table by the committee in a very grim and real way is that if we do not take immediate actions now, within the next 16 to 20 years, uh, we could be faced with a veritable catastrophe where some country, some part of some country may very well disappear. So the question is, what do we need to do? We need to make uh, certain that in addressing these issues, substantial input is borne out and comes from those persons who are most effective. It cannot be, as I said before, that you catch my house of fire and try to boast <laughs> that you got to the phone first to call the fire service to come and put the fire out. In fact, put like a, a local Calypsonian, and for those friends who don't know who a Calypsonian is, a person who sings Calypso is a genre in the Caribbean. One Calypsonian said, you know, it is the, it is the epiphany of madness for your best friend to cut your hand off and jump in first when the ambulance comes. And that is basically what is happening. Our lifelines, our livelihoods are actually being severed. And those who are responsible for all of the emissions that challenge our livelihoods to cut us off from being able to live and exist as a civilization in this part of the world, as is the case with the Pacific and elsewhere in the world and, 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 and in the least developed countries in Africa, those persons want to take the center stage for saying that they need to have uh, uh, the say in determining how it is addressed. That's the first problem. You can't solve that problem if the people who are most affected are not at the table. The second point, the ambition, as I said, has to be greater. A hundred million billion dollars a year cannot solve a hundred trillion dollar problem. It is just not adequate enough. Thirdly, and so there needs to be more commitment and greater commitment from countries like the US, the UK, and, and, and I really don't want to speak so much about the UK because we know the Minister of Finance, the Chancellor, um, you know, has, has, has proffered to cut his aid budget 
from 0.7% to 0.5%, which is about $4 billion a year, uh, and to use his SDRs uh, to, 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 to help uh, finance uh, the, 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 budget, the budget deficit as far as, as far as aid is concerned. So, so we wouldn't go there, and uh, we would be nice to him today. But, um, but we need now, thirdly, we need a concerted form of action that indicates to countries that if you are prepared to take the actions on your nationally um, designated uh, uh, commitments to making um, uh, changes to protect the environment, to cut your emissions, to do more greening, that those projects are going to be financed and financed completely by grants. Fourthly, if you are prepared to take those types of actions, we are prepared to meet you halfway, not only with concessional financing, but to ensure as well that specific and strategic financing interventions are made at the grassroots level with women, with children, with youth, with small farmers, with small producers, where, where the impact really happens from climate change. When farmers in Barbados or in St. Vincent or Grenada cannot get water because of the persistent droughts that we've been having over the last decade and a half, that have called on the water aquifers, on the ground aquifers, water aquifers, to run at extremely low levels, where they are now some of them drawing more mud than they are drawing water. When those things are happening because you're not getting the rainfall to get the runoff water, and those farmers cannot support their livestock, cannot produce their crops, and countries have to invest in desalination plants to ensure that they can get farmers water that those specific people are targeted in the proposals to ensure that they get resources to assist them to have a livelihood, to be able to survive, to feed a family. This is, these are the things that need to happen. This is the type of conversation that needs to come out of, of COP uh, 26. And I'm, I'm afraid that based on what we are hearing, not only at the granular, diplomatic and political levels, where the conversation has become so convoluted that it has lost many of the Irish persons around. But what is actually happening behind closed doors in the deals that are being made between countries, we are extremely disappointed to know that uh, this COP actually potentially could end up with less ambition, less targets, and less finance than the Paris Agreement. Now, if that is true, that would be a devastating blow to all of us. So those of us who are involved in campaigning, those of us who know what the issue is, what the issues are, and how it impacts on the average citizen, how it impacts on countries, why developing countries need to be able to get more grant funding and less debt, and to have what debt they have uh, 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 canceled, are significantly reformed, where we need countries to reallocate their unused SDRs rather than storing them up um, and looking at them and feeling very good about themselves with it. Those of us who understand those issues need to continue to press. And therefore, I think the, the, the role that Jubilee is playing is just tremendous in this, the role that other colleagues are playing internationally, the research that uh, Twice is doing, all of these things contribute, one, to a better understanding for our people, and two, to arm us with the details. And, and Faisi mentioned the point of um, the early uh, jubilation we had out of the jubilee movement uh, uh, early in the thousand, two, 2000s. I was part of that as the executive director of CPDC in those days, uh, working with Christian Aid and others uh, on these issues. Um, it, it, it was a point of uh, some point of jubilation because we did achieve some cancellation, but we know now that it was not adequate enough. And in any case, from our own arguments, then it was never intended to be the end of the street. It was a journey, and that journey continues uh, today. I'm happy to be part of it. I have been inside the beast of the 
the belly of the beast. So I know exactly how it functions. I know how budgets are established. I know how spending priorities are done. I know that we are always taught in the Ministry of Finance by the good old public officers who work in there, those of us who um, are politicians who manage to uh, get appointed to political office, um, you know, <clears throat> I know how they, they function. They tell you debt first, and then any other number can play. That's the, that's the mantra. So debt first, so you pay your debts. You always pay your creditors. And then anything else after that will flow. So it's debt, salaries, wages and pensions, and then as they say, any other number can play. But we know in the scheme of things that salaries, pensions, and wages can be adjusted. But there's a very hard and long road to adjust that. And therefore, I feel that it is time that we put that on the table as an item like any other item in the line, line item on the expenditure budget of a government our governments around the world to be adjusted. And we need our developed country partners to meet us because at the end of the day, they are really the ones who can assist in making those adjustments so that we lift that burden off countries, we free the fiscal space, and that we demand, and those of us in civil society have to do it, that if and when countries in the global South receive our, uh, that type of uh, debt relief, if they can relieve that debt relief, that appropriate, transparent governance systems are put in place to ensure that those resources go to the places, to the sectors, and to the people that matter most. So I will rest there. Um, sorry for getting so passionate about these issues, but um, you know, as I said, the urgency of now it is. Time is running out, and decisions, clear decisions, have to be made. Otherwise, we are going to face an existential problem, the making of which we, 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 we have never seen if this debt crisis uh, is allowed to explode as it will in another few months to year uh, on the world stage. Thank you very much, Heidi and colleagues. I am obliged to you. Thank you. Thank you. I think I'm muted. I'm not muted. Um, thank you, Chris, for that. Sorry, I thought I was muted. Um, thank you, Chris, so much for that. And thank and please never apologize for your passion. Um, but that's exactly what we need. Um, and we really appreciate you coming, joining us this evening. Um, like you said, having uh, the people most affected by these issues at the table is uh, so crucial. And so we are so glad that you're able to bring your voice um, because you really are living in a country where you are at the front lines of both the, cri the, the climate and the debt crises. Um, and also thank you for drawing attention to the systemic roots um, of the crises that we're talking about this evening. Um, you know, we are um, all in a global economy where um, it's where the, where, the, where, where the rules of the global economy have been organized in the interests of wealthy uh, countries um, and corporations. And actually we do need more acknowledgement around the role and the legacy of colonialism that has set up lots of these, lots of the economies in the global South um, have been set up for extraction and the enrichment um, of the global North. Um, so yeah, so thank you so much for uh, contributing uh, this evening to our event. And we're really looking forward to hearing some, of, some more from you later on when we get to the question and answers. Um, I'm just gonna move on to our third speaker this evening, um, uh, Belle Ribeiro Addy. Um, Belle is a Labour MP for Streatham. She was elected in 2019 and was formerly the Chief of Staff and Political Advisor to Diane Abbott, the former Shadow Home Secretary. And um, together with Diane, Belle played a key role in Parliament to expose the Windrush scandal. Um, Bell has also been vocal on calling on the government to cancel debts of former colonies, as well as make meaningful reparations for the UK's historic role in slavery and colonialism. Bell, thank you so much for joining us um, this evening. We know how busy it is um, as an MP, um, and let alone um, being on budget day, um, but also we also know that you are launching your own um, brand new all-party parliamentary group on Africans reparations um, very shortly. Um, so thank you so much for taking your um, time out. You're very busy schedule to, um, to to share with us this evening. Um, I'm really looking forward to your contribution. So I'll hand the floor over to you now. Thank you. And, and thank you so much for in, inviting me to speak. Um, and yesterday was, <clears throat> sorry, that uh, Conservatives aren't wearing uh, masks in Parliament. So it, 
everyone's getting a bit of coffee. But um, we know uh, that it was the Budget Day and often uh, it's, it's a case of do as I say and not as I do with our government. But I think their rhetoric is couldn't be any emptier than when it comes to, to global equality. Uh, at PMQs today, Boris Johnson actually denied that the government had cut the aid budget at all. And they do this quite often, actually. They do this thing where they cut 100% of something and then they put about 50% or a little bit extra back and then they expect us all to, to clap our hands and be happy as if we didn't figure out what was happening. And, and so the Chancellor also announced that he wouldn't be reversing aid cuts until 2023-24. Again, um, expecting a round of applause while clearly slashing an aid budget instead of stepping up to support the, the global south. And, and we have to be clear that this is aid that wouldn't be needed if countries in the global south hadn't, hadn't been looted, uh, ravaged and deliberately underdeveloped over years. And Quite frankly, we can't wait for climate action in any of these places until 2023-24. Um, we continue as a country to keep trading off the nostalgia of being world leaders. But if the pandemic um, has shown the world anything at all, it's that we can't really lead in anything. And I, I'm really worried that COP26 is going to show exactly uh, the same. It's so obvious that debt is holding back our response to the climate emergency and leaving people um, those that are on the front lines completely exposed. And, and those are countries where some of the poorest people live. They're on the front line of a climate emergency. They're spending up to five times more paying back unfair debts to wealthy countries like ours instead of putting forward clear and, 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 and proper climate measures. And, and many countries, many of these countries are also still playing for the legacy of empire and colonialism and having accrued all of that debt to pay for the damage done uh, to their nations. Therefore, former colonial powers um, like Britain, I think, have, have a moral obligation to support the rebuilding of countries in the global south and particularly in their battle against the climate crisis. Uh, we can't forget the cri crippling IMF uh, loans repayments that have made it even harder to develop social infrastructure. Um, and actually, this, this, this whole idea of aid, uh, which comes in and, 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 and is always the portion to, to the wrong type of energy, if it is for energy and infrastructure. Um, it's, it's, it's so corrupt at the, the way in which it's done. And uh, cancelling debt and, and is absolutely the right thing to do for people and, and, and planet. And we need to be clear um, and, and build upon this narrative that the polluter should pay in, in terms of a global approach to climate policy. And debt cancellation is obviously a key part of this. Because Whilst uh, countries like the UK um, became industrialized and prosperous off the back of empire and, and, and you know, enormous carbon emissions, low income countries are responsible for less than 1% of, of, of the world's emissions. Now, people keep saying, particularly in this country, you'll see people say, oh, well, you know, um, and I, I get asked this question a lot, a lot why, aren't, why aren't more, uh, you know, black, Asian, minority ethnic people involved in climate um, campaigns, you know, we don't see them really engaging. And I'm like, well, that I, I, that I, I don't, do they really care enough about the environment? That I think is, 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 is ridiculous, firstly, because those countries are more likely to be at the front line. And even for those of us living here, it's a situation where um, when some countries of, of, of our family's origin, you often find that before any aid reaches the country, money is reaching it in terms of remittances. And, and actually, with climate campaigning here, unfortunately, people of colour are less likely to put themselves in situations where they're going to be arrested by the police. So that may mean that you may not see them out on the streets, but it does not mean they, do, they don't care. And, 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 and just generally, I'm thinking about what a scandal aid has been over, overall um, in terms of all of the money that's pulled towards it, um, which as, as far as I'm concerned, making it sound like it's not conditional is, is not the case. And actually when, when these very, very disastrous occurrences happen in countries in the global South, and you see these aid agencies put up all of their, um, what people like to call poverty porn these days, you don't realize how much money is not going to these countries, and when the money does go to this country, these countries, what private companies they may be going to, um, which you know is all in in, in the cycle of of, of government um, um, uh, giving money to to particular types of shareholders and whatnot. But but every single time 
um, that these disasters happen. And we know they're coming every year. Chris uh, was from Barbados, somewhere I've been uh, quite privileged to spend um, a, a lot of time because I know somebody there, so that makes it a cheaper holiday. Um, um, but you, you go and you see that every single time something happens, there's efforts to rebuild. And a lot of the rebuilding is not sustainable. Um, and, and, and that happens in various countries across the world. And, and it's because of, of the way in which aid is spent quite recklessly. One thing I would say that I would love to see in other countries, but I think Barbados does quite well, is I, I could see barely any homes, uh, Chris, that didn't have solar panels on the top of them. When I think about sustainable um Putting, putting sustainable things in place, but sustainable e energy in place, you would think that aid would have been it would have been spent where it could have been on things such as that, um, which I believe could have been done uh, time and time over if we if we'd looked at where we're putting 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 money, because the reality is again and again that people in 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 Britain are actually just emitting more and more and more carbon than your average person in a number of different in different countries. Now it. it in 2009, I believe it was, uh, Gordon Brown actually led countries um, and agreed them to mobilise that $100 uh, billion for climate financing by 2020. Um, but I, I absolutely agree uh, with the Centre for Global Development um, that it's going to have to be double. We're going to have to commit double that if we're going to if we're going to have to do that. And that's one thing that this government is very, very bad at. They don't understand that sometimes you have to spend your money earlier to tackle uh, the crisis. I can see they're not going to, they not they don't have that vision when it comes to spending earlier to, to tackle climate uh, breakdown. And it, it isn't the kind of challenge um, that calls for, for, for balancing um, the books, as they often like to say um, that they're doing. We can't simply, knowing the crisis that we face, go back to the old world of debt and sanctions and, and conflict. We can't go back to uh, corrupt aid um, and, 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 and looking at how it's spent again we are being a bit more blatant with with the strings attached because we've seen our, our um international development um office moved back into the foreign office as if there weren't enough strings uh, attached already and, and and i believe and that's one of the reasons why we're, we're launching this all-party parliamentary group uh, today uh, to look at these issues that we need to look at, at um, our approach to tackling climate change in countries in the global south as, as a form of climate reparations. There are many different ways uh, to make reparations, um, but, but, but climate reparations is a very, very direct and easy way to do it. It's one that will actually not just benefit those countries, but in turn benefit uh, the, the, the entire planet in terms of our efforts uh, to stop the climate crisis. So the, the, the idea that countries like ours should be given back in that in that way, as far as I'm concerned, clear. And it shouldn't be loans, it, it shouldn't be aid, it should be a very, very clear contract, understanding that wrongs have been done and doing everything they can to, to, to rectify it. Because as far as I'm concerned, if we're serious about leading global efforts to tackle the climate emergency, then we need to take those necessary steps. We need to look more seriously um, at debt cancellation and, and restructuring um, I know that during the last year, during the pandemic, the G20 countries actually took this decision to suspend debts uh, to allow nations to deal with the pandemic. And there's absolutely no excuse for them to not go, go further. It, it could be done at what was the worst time for, for most countries right across the world. Um, and we need to ensure that this also, and, and again, not just talking about governments, it has to extend to private creditors too. Um, and we need to make sure that we use every single lever that we can, legal, political and, and, and financial, to ensure that private creditors uh, accept debt cancellation. And I believe that there are ways that we could do that. I mean, it, it, it just completely rests on the fact that actually the countries that are suffering the most are not to blame. Um, and they're currently not only burdening the majority of the effect, they're also actually burdening the majority of the cost that can't be right in any way shape or form and it has to be the moral duty on countries like ours and I think at some point the legal duty um, that we make sure that they have the financial means uh, to fight this and, and I'm really sorry I can't stay uh, for the rest of the meeting because we are going off to launch to launch that but I, I really continue to support Jubilee uh, debt campaign and everything um, that they're doing and, and just to make people see that this makes absolute sense and, and anything else um, is not going to get us out of the crisis that we're currently in. Thank you.
Thank you, Belle. Yeah. Um, that was um, a really, um, um, really interesting um, and insightful contribution. And I really like what you were talking about, you know, about aid, thinking about rethinking aid and thinking about aid, not just in terms of charity, but actually in reparations and compensation and the recognition of the role that countries like the UK have played in terms of um, looting, extraction and underdevelopment, you know, that, that even led to the reason why we need to even have aid in the first place. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much. And I really um, wish you the very best for your launch in about 10 minutes um, for your new um, all party parliamentary group on uh, African reparations. Um, it looks like a really exciting event and you've got a great range of speakers there. So um, good luck for that event and thank you so much for joining us. Can you stay for a few more minutes, do you think, or do you have to really rush off? I can't hear you so muted. Sorry, probably a couple more minutes, but I asked the speakers to sign on a bit early, so I probably should. As well. okay. <laughs> All right, no problem. So I was just thinking, I was just um, um, just have a quick look at some of the question about yeah. the connection between colonialism, COVID and climate change um, are inextricably interlinked. Um, who is the debt owed to? Um, and if it, if it was cancelled, how would it happen? So just any thoughts on that particular question? And then, yeah, please feel free to rush off and join. Well, and, well, I mean, I mean, the, the, the debt is clearly owed to those countries that have, have, have suffered the most. Um, and, and I think at the moment, those would be the countries in the global south. Colonialism, um, people just like to kind of categorize it as something that happened in a period of time. But we need to be clear that all of these countries were deliberately underdeveloped. It wasn't that, um, you know, they just had uh, people ruling over them at one time or even the really racist narrative that, oh, you know, we, we made things better there we came and we improved things none, none of that is it, it, it's completely false these countries were underdeveloped and since then there's been a form of neo-colonialism that has continued to keep all of their major resources either through debt by 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 holding holding them to holding these countries to debt or actually through actually just continuing to extract <laughs> their natural resources um and if they are being paid for it paying them a pittance uh, for it so uh, that, that cycle continues um, and we look at the fact again thinking of the pandemic that it was a whole load of public money that went into creating those vaccines a whole lot of public money a whole lot of public research actually and the money from that is going to shareholders and you know as, as, as far as I touch on before the COVAX scheme is just it's, it's just not it's just not happening and if we are giving vaccines to other countries uh, we are again giving it in a form of aid saying look at us give us a pat on the back we're we're kindly giving you these wonderful vaccines, um, you should be happy. Uh, so, 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 yeah, absolutely agree um, that they're all, that, that that they're all linked. And just as they were able to create a situation where they stopped, um, they stopped, uh, they stopped debt repayments during the pandemic. They can do one now. They can do the same now for the climate crisis. It, it, it's not that hard. Um, we would not suffer. The idea that countries like ours would suffer if we weren't collecting this money back in is simply not true. Um, we just have our priorities all wrong. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. And um, yeah, good luck and um, all the best for your own meeting in about five minutes. <laughs> Bye, Bill. Um, so yeah, so we're, um, so we're left with, so we've still got Pfizer and we've still got Chris um, uh, with us. Um, so we can start tackling some of the questions that have been coming through on the chat and the question and answer. Um, so um, I'm just gonna um, pull out um, one of the questions. <laughs> um, so we had a question quite early on um, and there was a lot of interest um, um, in this question. Uh, let me just try and find it here. Okay. Um, uh, sorry. There we are. Sorry. It's a question from Alicia, um, which says, um, do you ever find that some countries are in debt because of corrupt government officials? Um, and then there's a couple of comments of, of people wanting to know the answers to this question. And then we also had uh, Tom Lines, who I also know um, from a previous role. Um, uh, uh, Tom's also made some really fantastic contributions to that question in the chat. So do, do read Tom's um, responses in the chat as well. But um, Chris and Pfizer, does, does any one of you want to kind of contribute on that question about government corruption? But I mean, perhaps I can go first. Um, the, the, I, I mean, it's a very interesting question, but this challenge of debt and the incurrence of debt and the uh, magnitude of the problem is, 
it goes far beyond the, 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 what we have the conversation about corruption. Uh, corruption does happen and it is very costly uh, to many governments and many countries. But uh, beyond um, corrupt officials, and of course, you know, I always make the point, it takes two to tango. So government officials are corrupt. They're corrupt because somebody has corrupted them. Um, uh, and therefore, uh, uh, as I saw in the chat, uh, a comment about transnational corporations and well, the big private sector entities who enter into countries and who pay bribes and do other things and all of those things, those things are true. And that is endemic. That's an endemic issue that has to be tackled uh, at its root cause. But when as um, our colleague uh, who just spoke, uh, really began to focus in and zero in on the issue of on the development. On the development comes at a cost. If, if, I, if I ask you to do a job, I invite you to do a job, or I give you a job to do, but I don't give you the tools to do the job, then I can't come back and say to you, but how did you manage to get X or Y done and uh, why did you spend so much money doing it? How did you get yourself in this debt? You got yourself in the debt because you had to go at the hardware store and buy the tools. The tools weren't provided. The resources weren't provided. So you borrowed from a friend. You borrowed from an old uncle. You borrowed from an aunt. You borrowed from a whatever. You got the resources to try to get the job done. And in doing so, you put yourself uh, into bonds of debt. And that's basically what has happened. That's the colonial legacy. You're left with, an econ with a set of economies that are underdeveloped, social structures that are underdeveloped. And you gain independence and everybody's happy and we are now self-determining and all of those things, those nice things that we did in the 1960s. And we feel very good about it. The question is the day after you signed the instruments for independence, the question is how, but how are you going to provide now for the education of your youth? How are you going to provide jobs for your women folk? How are you going to provide livelihoods uh, for those persons who exist in your society that need them? What type of education? What quality of health care? And in order to do that, you need resources. But your economies are not developed enough, don't have the capacity enough, and simply in some instances are just structurally too small to be able to provide that adequately. And because you have been given a job without the tools, you now have to go spend the money to get the tools, to build infrastructures that matter and that are sturdy and that are worthy of building an economy on, to build out economic structures, to invest in enterprises, to try to attract foreign, foreign direct investment, to invest in education and healthcare and social welfare and so forth and so on, that you have a, an educated, healthy, and uh, population that is in good being. And therefore, in order to do that, you have to go borrow. So you're either going to borrow from the multilateral institutions, and we know what that entails, or you borrow from the private capital markets, as I said before, at premium, at high cost, at premium risk costs. Mm. And therefore, as that goes on and on, you pile on the debt. At some point in time, it becomes extremely difficult for you to keep up with the payments. And what you do, the system is structured this way, you borrow, to pay debt. So you roll your debt over. <laughs> In other words, I have a debt payment coming up. It's $20 million, $100 million. I'm going to borrow $150 million. $100 million will roll over the debt that is due, the instrument that is due, because it's matured. And the additional sweetener of $50 million from the creditors is to help you to do some other things. Now, some of that, of course, can, can go by the way of corruption. It's true. But the majority of it, frankly, goes, try to go into development uh, concerns and in many ways are not adequate enough. So you keep doing this and you do this and you do this until it becomes unsustainable. And then the question is, how do you pay? So you have all these creditors. The IMF, very interestingly enough, makes the point, we can do a debt sustainability analysis for you. We can tell you, the things that we feel you should do to get your debt down to a sustainable level, that the debt to GDP ratio is 60% or whatever arbitrary figure they come up with that nobody has yet been, been able to prove whether or not it is, it is real or, or, or otherwise. However, 
we are not going to engage you in an exercise or lead you in an exercise not to pay your creditors. Because the role of the IMF, the IMF was specifically created to ensure that creditors get paid. That's their role. Don't forget that that is what the Bretton Woods institutions are about. So you go now to your private creditors, who are, of course, not happy that you can't pay your debt. And they, they allow you to enter into a debt exchange, whatever, whatever, and you do that. However, once you get cut off from the international capital markets, the private capital markets, you then have to resort to the multilaterals. And the multilaterals really mean an IMF program where austerity is, is um, instituted because you have to do fiscal consolidation. You have to get your expenditure and your revenue more in line, preferably revenue ahead of expenditure, uh, i.e. a primary surplus. And in order to do that, you have to cut social spending, education, healthcare, social welfare, and in some instances, capital works or infrastructure. So when you do that, where do you land? Right back at the stage where you need to borrow more money <laughs> once you get hold of these programs, if you are lucky enough to get hold of them, to be able to catch back up because you have fallen so far behind the rest of the world in producing citizens that are, are able to compete globally in this new globalized environment, that you have to borrow more money in order to catch back up. So the debt cycle continues and continues and continues. What, however, COVID has done, and I think our colleague Pfizer has made that very, very important and critical point. COVID has now removed the plaster and exposed, sorry for the very graphic language, that festering sore of debt that has always been there. It has now exposed it and has not only exposed it, it has caused uh, virtual rigor mortis to set in in terms of economies because the deterioration is even more, is even greater now because countries are actually having to pay to shore up their public uh, health responses and economic responses to COVID because they have been forced to do fiscal consolidation, austerity, cut programs, cut health and education, cut social welfare, cut small business, cut enterprise. And therefore, now that they have been faced with this existential crisis called COVID, uh, that has exposed all of that, we are now seeing that they're, they're having to borrow to finance this. And that now is adding fuel to the fire. So that's why the debt crisis uh, has now become accelerated and has become now exponential to an even greater global crisis. One of the things that I would really love to happen, but it will never happen, it may be a pipe dream, it would be nice to have all of the major, all of the developing countries to build a coalition to say that on X day, if we cannot get a proper workout on that from our developing country, developed country partners, from our multilateral institutions, from our private creditors, we will all on X day agree to default. Even if for one, pay, one set of payments, we are not going to pay any debt on X day and withhold that from, uh, from them so that they can get the picture that this world economy is really going to be in a serious problem unless we address this issue of debt. Otherwise, we're gonna have a whole set of failed states. We're gonna have coups all over the place. We're gonna have the, the rampant crime uh, uh, and degradation. This is now a serious problem. And we cannot, we can no longer postpone it. So, the question really is now, is not, not the corruption. Corruption has to be dealt with endemically, has to be dealt systematically uh, across the system. But we cannot lose, we cannot lose focus on the bigger picture. Because if we do, and looking at some certain minutia, then we are going to lose this battle going forward. And that's just my Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I think that was a really comprehensive um, answer um, and probably touched on a lot of points that I would have probably said if someone asked me that, that, that same question. Um, Pfizer, did you want to contribute on this one? Um, if not, we can move on to the next question. Uh, yeah, just aware of time. I can I can pick up on a few points. I think Chris like covered it perfectly. So if you want to, I can start on the next question if you want. Okay, that's fine. 
Um, and also just, just to finish off this question, I just want to point to David um, Kenvin's response. I think he's a, probably a GB Debt campaign supporter, though correct me if I'm wrong, David, um, but he, 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 he um, in, his, in his comment on the chat, he talks about odious debts and illegal debts, um, which are also different forms of um, uh, debts that have been incurred um, that um, without the democratic participation of the people and therefore um, we would probably consider these unjust debts as well. So um, yeah, do read that comment from David in, in the chat as well. Um, Faisal, I wonder whether you can um, maybe uh, contribute on this question about trade policies as well. I was wondering whether uh, the question is how significant are trade policies in exacerbating the plight of poor countries? And so in the sort of range of countries that you um, managed to speak to as part of your research, did any of those countries talk about uh, the impact of um, uh, uh, trade policies or, or unfair trade deals um, on the impact of their economies? Um, I mean, actually, they, it's not something that comes up prominently in the discussions that we've we've had. Although, of course, um, you know, trade often has similar power imbalances to to final to finance and you know other forms of global in, in infrastructure. And so, you can imagine that there are all sorts of issues with current like currency flows and. Uh, that that exacerbate the issue, um, and so certainly trade policy is part of it. Um, as as are issues of tax justice and, and finance, um, the finance system. Um, I just wanted to pick up on a couple of points, just thinking about what Chris was just saying. And you know, the problem now, as opposed to twenty years ago, is that the the credit situation is so much more complicated. I can see people asking questions about China or private creditors, um, and certainly because of the way Chris has spoken about this ratcheting up of debt and like then having to get more and more debt to pay the interest rates from these loans and um, you know countries like the the country that my mum was from Pakistan you know they look much more to China now and private creditors and one of the things that really played out as COVID hit and um, and the World Bank and others said okay we'll we'll put a pause on your we'll put a pause on your debt payments oh so kind of them we won't cancel it but we'll put a pause on it for a year um you know uh was that countries were stuck countries that started to take up those initiatives were immediately downgraded by these private sector credit agencies in the world that actually have so much power. And then countries like Pakistan are like, well, now we're in trouble because um, our, our interest rates that we have to pay to our private creditors is a lot higher. Um, and so it's like, you can think about the debt system right now, maybe it's like a maze, but every way you turn is a dead end that you just kind of get stuck in there. And, um, you know, countries are really in a bind because of this combination of that cycle of, of getting into debt plus the actual way in which the debt system works. Um, and, you know, when you think about kind of innovative solutions, I've heard people look at, you know, having a publicly owned credit agency, for instance, or, you know, how we have to think seriously about how we um, get uh, G20 countries, uh, we get the Paris Club of Lenders, we get the World Bank, IMF, we get, you know, very much um uh, those private creditors and, and 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 china is a key part of this as well and really um coordinate a response across those different uh, those different lenders in today's world and that's one of the reasons why it's harder to just say we'll just cancel the debt because of these different creditors so we have to think a bit more about um what we do on that um i think also just coming back to um this issue of I, reparations and, and the way in which we need to be talking about these issues you know we, we really do need a, a reframing of aid and debt and debt cancellation to to talk much more about justice this is about justice you know, it really as I said it made me angry when I was looking down the list of those countries my dad is from the Fiji islands which you know small island state Pakistan both suffering from my mum's from Pakistan suffering from climate climate crisis is happening in their lives um, every day. It's affecting them um, in various different ways. Um, and, and to think it, that those countries owe the UK something, they were, the UK was in Pakistan for 200, Pakistan then India for 200 years, and we owe them something. I mean, I just couldn't, like, you just can't get your head around it. Um, and we do need to think much more about the story we tell. And this is one of the problems with, say, talking about, um, uh, corruption, of course, there's a huge issue of corruption across countries, across, I mean, in the UK as well. I mean, look at COVID contracts, you know, that there, there are huge issues with government corruption across across the world. Um, but but sometimes that is used then as an excuse 
not to take action and not to um, provide justice. And, you know, like Chris said, that countries are saying that well, we, we're willing to meet you actually. So, okay, if you're gonna cancel this debt, we're gonna come together and have this uh, debt relief program, then we can do X and Y to demonstrate where that money's going. Um, and it's also incumbent as us as civil society actors to support civil society in those countries that then put pressure on their governments to do the right thing and, and, and ensure that there's accountability there. Um, so I think, you know, I think the issue for us is that, that, that it is far more complicated by trade policy, um, but broadly how the debt system is working now, uh, which makes it far more complicated for countries um, and actually for us as debt, as debt campaigners. Thank you, Pfizer, for that. And actually, thank you for knocking off a few, uh, for sort of responding to a few questions actually in the in the Q and A um, in your response there. So um, I think you, yeah, you touched on the China question, you touched on the trade question, um, and some some of the private creditors questions. So thank you for that. Um, why you did that response? Um, we have um, uh, maybe a question. We don't have. We've got about eight minutes left, but um, maybe if this question, um, both Chris and Pfizer, if you could make a uh, be good to hear some of your thoughts on this question. Um, but how do we create the public pressure? to force governments to cancel the debt. We did this with sanctions against apartheid, but it took um, about 30 years and we did not have that time. What kind of actions do you think we should do now? So um, maybe if you take about, yeah, a, a, a few minutes each for this one, that'd be great. I, I think I think it's, um, it's again, it's an, it's an excellent question because it's, it's, it's really a painstaking exercise. Um, as far as I said, because the because the the the, the, the melu the pantheon of creditors is so wide uh, and so broad, it's difficult to get everybody on the same. We saw that with the DSSA, the uh, debt sus suspension um, initiative um, that the G20 put up. Uh, they can they, they have not been able to get private creditors on board. Private creditors are not coming on board. For those countries who participated, the ratings agencies threatened to or actually downgraded them. Because in most of the debt, and I kind of know this from my own experience, um, in most of the uh, creditor instruments and the debt instruments that we uh, countries engage, you have what you call cross default um, clauses. So that if you agree in any fashion to restructure any part of your debt, to have a debt cancellation, it is considered to be a default and you, 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 you automatically can trigger defaults in other debts that you have not even addressed or had not even touched. So the, 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 the entire system is, 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 is to use a popular term, is corrupt. The, 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 the whole thing uh, leads, locks you in because the creditor's interests come first. Um, so, so the first thing is that how do you get everybody at the table? you're not going to get everybody at the table, certainly not at the same time. And it, it was not going to happen unless very powerful developing countries like UK and the United States, particularly the centers where New York and London, where most of these deals are subject to the law, uh, whether it is New York law or English law or um, British law, to agree to come to the table. So your ultimate goal is to have the debts canceled. Um, but you work your way across. And I don't say down, but you work your way across. You look at issues pertaining to uh, suspensions. We know suspensions only work temporarily. You look at um, a reformulation of the tenure, in other words, a restructuring, that you can bring the interest down, interest rates down to more meaningful and achievable targets, and you can push the tenure, that is the time you have to pay this debt out realistically, say uh, by 25 to 50 years. Um, to, 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 to make it happen. Then you have a combination uh, with it, in addition to that, is that you have a financing arrangement where you can, um, where, in fact, before you even get there, you can also do what we have been arguing for, many of us, what we call debt swaps, debt swaps. So you can have a debt financial swap. Um, I wanna cancel your debt, um, developing countries, multilateral institutions, and private creditors, we're gonna cancel your debt, but here's what we want. We want you to invest the resources that you will save from having to pay that debt in climate, in greening, in social development, in health and education and so forth and so on. So you can have any myriad of, of stuff that you can do. But then uh, beyond that, 
What you also want to have is a reform of the development finance system to ensure that those countries who require uh, financing to develop their social development sectors, uh, to build infrastructure, education, healthcare, and so forth and so on, can access resources, if not on a grant basis, certainly at a very nominal and low interest rate, 0.5, no long, no more than one percent. Uh, and what you get in the World Bank, either the International Development Association. In order to have that, you need to look at a whole question of the vulnerability index. Which countries are most vulnerable? Why are they vulnerable? And how can we ensure that they can access development resources on the basis of their vulnerability? And then, of course, there's your overall question of reparations. How do we begin to fill those gaps that we left? These are developed countries, colo former colonial uh, uh, masters, former colonial colony holding states. How do we begin to fill those gaps that we left when we exited those colonies? And what is the cost of doing that? And that can be costed right now and adjusted. I'm sure if Isaac and Joshi is an economist by um, uh, uh, adjusted for inflation. <laughs> even so that we can know what is the actual bill that can be paid or that must be paid to ensure that these countries are put in a better position. So it's not just straight cancellation of debt. Yes, that's an ultimate goal, but there's certain gradations that we have that we can uh, achieve uh, the goal of getting to a near cancellation uh, of the debt or certainly making it a lot more palatable for countries in the uh, global south to be able to manage uh, their affairs and to do so successfully. Thanks, Chris. Pfizer, did you want to come in on uh, that question? Uh, about, no, I mean, Chris did a great job there. I mean, he's right. There's, you know, of course, there's an end goal, but there's things that we can do more immediately. I mean, one thing that I think, you know, countries domestically would get a lot of support for as well is if we saw at least the cancelling of debt of anything that's been spent on COVID. I mean, of course, you know, that was completely not their fault. I mean, it's just like, it's just obvious that something like that will um, will be a, thi a thing to do that would also, you know, I know it's annoying when governments act like they're so good when, you know, they've got countries into this uh, in the first point, but the reality is that they want to score points. They want to look like the good guys. And that's just an obvious first step to take. Um, and I think uh, when we look, we did some polling across um, eight of our key countries, which included Canada, Sweden, South Korea, uh, Uruguay, Costa Rica, Mexico, Sierra Leone, and Tunisia. And, and one thing that we found that for the higher middle income countries, that despite what we might think, um, there was huge support amongst the public that their countries either give the same amount or more to lower income countries. So I think it's really quite striking that there is, a, there is room here for us as public campaigners as well to get people on side to put pressure on governments. This is really obvious first steps. Um, you know, like, yeah, like the interest rates, for instance, lowering interest rates. So some countries are paying interest rates 10% higher than the, you know, the UK is or, or high. I mean, it's just, uh, it's, outra it's outrageous. Um, and so I think um, th there are things that need to happen there. And I, I agree with Chris, I would love to see, absolutely love to see some collective action, countries coming together. And, and we saw some of that when, when there was discussions with discussions with the sustainable development goals and financing for development, when um, sort of 88 countries clubbed together alongside China, Brazil and India and tried to have their own negotiations uh, before they would um, push against the kind of rich country powers. Um, and we do need something like that. I mean, I was interested that the PM of Bangladesh came out um, a few months ago and said that developing or low and middle income countries should stop paying debts in order to fund essential adaptation now. So there are murmurs from countries and leaders of countries to make this happen. So really, you know, as always, as always, there's power in, in numbers um, and, and to to try, I think the problem is, is that there's very few conveners that will be able to bring them those countries together. So maybe this is something for us to think about, uh, uh, you know, going forward in terms of how we get people to the table to say that we're gonna we're gonna come together and, and shout about this. Thank you. Right, right, and and, I'm, and I've just got like I'm just gonna squeeze in like another two questions, but I'm gonna ask them together, and then you can choose which of those questions you want to respond to. But if you could keep your responses to about a minute or two minutes, that'd be great because um we're, we're we're coming to the end of our session, but I did want to squeeze these last two in. So um I'm gonna ask them together, and you can like I said you can either answer both of them um in 
in a couple of minutes or you can answer just one of them. But the, first, the quest, one question is about what can be done about vulture companies who buy up debts when they never even lent anything in the first place? Um, and uh, another question, which I'm not sure whether anyone knows the answer to this question, um, but has anyone calculated the amount of reparations owed? Uh, UK, I know UK extracted around 20 trillions from India alone during the colonial period, but not sure. Yeah, but, we, we, but yeah, but I'm not sure whether anyone, whether, yeah, you know the answer to that question, but any contribution or any kind of um, uh, comments around either of those two, um, it'd be great if you could do that in a, like I said, a couple of minutes each, please. Well, if I can do it in a minute, in terms of the last, <laughs> last issue, the, the, the issue of reparations is not, it's not only about money. Um, yes, that's important. And we want to ensure that resources are available to those countries which were colonized and which have the stain of colonialism and underdevelopment on them. But it's the acceptance that the problem was actually created and that the problem was created by somebody and that somebody needs to take responsibility for it. And that I think that's the first thing before we even get to quantifying um, and we want to get to quantifying, you have to get acceptance. And, and that, that I think is, is the most difficult stage to get. Um, we've been having more open conversations and that's good. So I think that um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the case where in the context where that is happening, that's good, but we need to push that forward uh, uh, a little more. So I, 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 would, I, I would agree, yes, um, we need to quantify and we can do that because we have people who can do those kinds of things, actuarial scientists and economists and so forth. But it's the acceptance that the problem exists and that it was created by somebody and that person has to take responsibility. Uh, for having created uh, the mess that they did. Thanks, Chris. Um, Pfizer, did you want to take a stab at one of those questions? <laughs> yeah, just, I mean, on vulture companies, I mean, it, was, it is like pure evil how they operate um, and, the, and, the, and the role that they play. But I think the bigger problem here is just the financial system in general and the way in which it gives room to, um, you know, black market, very immoral acts um, from various from various different um, organizations. So I think, you know, I sorry to not have a clear answer on the spot, but you know, often the ways in which you deal with these things is to make it unprofitable. So you put in um, whether it's tax, whether it's extra um, levies, um, to make these sorts of sorts of behavior unprofitable. Um, and so there's, I'm sure, the experts on these companies will be able to tell know exactly what those disincentives are but there's certainly no excuse for it to be happening there's certain action certainly action that can be taken and just one more point just to, to finish on i think you know yeah as chris said the reparations isn't just about the money and i think um uh, one thing that we should be also talking about is all of the technology that needs to be shared all of the green technology that needs to be shared I and mean, one of the things that's happened with vaccines for instance is just how quickly countries locked up you know, and these private companies were allowed to lock up um, their ingredients for those vaccines. Um, and so we need to be also fighting on that front so that countries, you know, it's part of justice, it's part of not waiting for the for rich countries to help you out. Like, you know, low middle income countries don't want that, they can do things for themselves, but certainly reparations need to be thought of in, share, in, in terms of sharing the technology as well. And, and I think, um, Heidi, if I, if I may just add to what Faisal said in relation to um, the question of the vulture companies, it's an issue of it's an issue of serious regulation, and it's also an issue of recognizing that many of those vulture companies would have limited, uh, less space to operate and do what they do if you didn't have ratings agencies doing what they do, because when ratings agencies downgrade the country's debt to what they call junk, that is when it becomes, uh, that is when the vultures sweep in because they smell the carrion. This is now dead, this is, this is dead weight. We're going to swoop up the dead weight, we're going to buy it, and then we're going to retrade it. <laughs> and meanwhile, the country that has been downgraded now has to go in, probably into an IMF program, into a debt restructuring. And by the time they get back to the capital markets, that debt that they have had, uh, that was on their books that has been bought up by those, um, those uh, uh, vultures, now begins to give a premium that they make millions and billions of. Them. So we, we have to, these relationships have to be explored and exploded. And I think too, as well, 
the deep relationship between the ratings agencies and the interlateral financial institutions, particularly the IMF. And nobody speaks about it, but it happens. They work in tandem. One tries to drive the other into, in, drive you into the arms of the other. So I am going to downgrade you and downgrade you and downgrade you until you take an IMF program. And when you take an IMF program, then I will upgrade you. Because the, the concept is you can't run your affairs. The IMF will run it for you. And I will tell your creditors when you get into an IMF program, oh, don't worry, we have them under control now. We can now do what we need to do. This is how sinister the system is. And this is why uh, change needs to happen uh, at the multilateral level. But it's not going to happen if you leave it to the IMF, if you leave it to the World Bank. It has to be removed out of there and brought into a space that is far more transparent and far more democratic. Thank you, Chris. And um, that's a really amazing um, a spur to, to, to jolt us all into action and to, to join the debt justice movement um, and to make these demands um, on, the, on the World Bank, on the IMF, because it's only when people come together that we can um, really uh, expose how, how, these, how, how the system works um, to keep these countries um, impoverished. Um, I just want to say thank you, Chris and Pfizer, for your contributions this evening, and um, we've, I've really enjoyed listening to you both. I'm personally a big fan of you both, so um, I've really enjoyed this evening and having this conversation with you. Thank you for covering a whole range of topics um, in the questions. I want to say thank you to the participants for coming this evening. Um, I'm sorry if we didn't manage to cover every single question. I think that we have touched on most of them through um, the responses that Pfizer and Chris have, have given, um, but I also want to thank you for being such an engaged uh, participant as well. I see that the chat has and, and has been very active this evening and there's been some really fantastic contributions from various people um, in that chat stream so I feel that the chat the chat this evening has been just as interesting as some of the speakers as well so thank you for that I'm going to finish off by pointing you to some things that you can do practically in response to some of the things that we've heard this evening um, and I'm going to ask my colleague Zach to pull up the links as I kind of um, reel out this list of things that you can think about about things that you can do um, we want to um, encourage you to if you if you really um, uh, feel really moved to, to, to want to take action around um, this issue around debt justice and for climate justice, then please um, sign up to our petition um, where we call for the debt to be cancelled for climate justice. Um, if you want to find out more, we've got um, a blog post and a briefing um, that my colleagues will put links into. Um, the, the, the briefing will have much more detail um, around uh, some of the things we've talked about this evening and we'll actually um, and touch upon some of the more technical aspects of some of the questions that were asked as well. Um, so do have a look at that um, briefing. The blog post is a, a summarized version of that if you don't have very much time. Um, if you're actually going to Glasgow for, for COP, um, we are going to be part of the Economic Justice Movement Assembly on the 3rd of November. Um, and uh, to do come along to that if you're in Glasgow go um, and also uh, our, our friends at Global Justice Now are holding a, an event called Reparations, Debt and Climate Justice um, which will be part of the People's Summit and again we'll put those links up and then um, whether you're in Glasgow, London or any other uh, part of the UK um, and actually indeed any part of the world um, um, do join in on the Global Day of Action on the 6th of November. Um, it's been organised as a massive day of action across the world. Um, there should be a local march or a local protest that you can join um, so that you can join so, so that you can come along and join us on the streets. Um, we believe that there is power in protest and change comes through powerful diverse movements and so we want to join in solidarity with our friends in the global south to demand climate debt and racial justice um, that we've been talking about this evening and though the scale of the climate crisis and debt crisis are absolutely huge um, and we've talked about the entrenched interests um, that we are battling against um, we know that this current economic system is unsustainable it's unfit for purpose and it's insufficient to address any of the crises that we've been talking about um, so this is a time to join the dots between our issues and to work together and create the spaces and push for the solutions that deliver both both climate justice and debt justice. So thank you so much for coming to this webinar. Um, and if you are going to be in Glasgow, I'll look forward to seeing you there um, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Okay.